Released in 1997, Satoshi Kon's psycho thriller anime Perfect Blue was his breakthrough feature film, an extremely loose adaptation of Yoshikazu Takeuchi's novel of the same name, and a story that sees Kon's soon to recur themes of fiction and reality blurring together, brought to life through psychological horror. Kon and screenwriter Sadayuki Murai's film tracks Japanese pop star and fledgling actress Mima Kirigo whose transition from singing to acting causes a stalker to begin threatening her life. But the pressures of being stalked, the difficulty of trying to become a star, and abuse from the industry around her begin to break Mima's mind, shattering the line between reality, fiction, and hallucination as danger closes in. And Perfect Blue is disturbing to say the least. A thriller that combines both psychological horror and slasher scares in an intimate portrayal of exploitation that illustrates Satoshi Kon's mastery over the medium, even in his first feature film. Navigating our way through Perfect Blue alongside Mima is a descent into the darkest reaches of the human psyche in the hopes of reaching back up into the light. But in this story of perception, doubling, and identity, there may be no true escape once we've glimpsed the other side. While Perfect Blue shares its name with Takeuchi's 1991 novel, it shares few similarities beyond the general plot of a former pop idol being stalked and characters sharing names. Takeuchi had adapted his novel into a screenplay that was originally intended as a live-action film. But when Madhouse Studio took over and brought Kohn on board to direct, the entire film was reset. Kohn later admitted to disliking the script, and when he was given permission to rewrite as he liked, as long as the new direction retained Mima as a pop idol with a violent stalker, the story majorly changed. To be honest, I used Perfect Blue because it was the title of the original novel, said Kohn. I presume the words had some significance, but as I changed the story and probably the subject as well, I guess the meaning was lost. I can only guess because I didn't read the novel. I simply read through the rough plot, which was described as close to the original story, in the project plan delivered to me. We discussed changing the title, but I liked it. It sounds significant and mysterious. The result is that Kohn and Mirai's film is far more focused on the psychological horror of Mima's story, but also takes into account the horrors of being in the public eye that exist whether or not Mima's mind breaks from the pressure. It's the horror of being perceived, whether you like it or not. Perfect Blue starts with groups of men discussing Mima before her final show with J-pop group Chom. Even before we meet our star, we're exposed to what everyone thinks of her. And in the rare moments that aren't focused on Mima later on, Kohn cuts away to more men commenting on the changes she's making to her career. Outside those men, we see the toll Mima's choices are taking on her manager Rumi. But really, our perception and Mima's are one. Slowly, we become more and more aware of the stalker known as Mimania. But rather than take on the role of observer, we experience the horror of being watched alongside our protagonist. Kohn draws our attention to this early on as Mima first becomes aware of something called Mima's room, and we cut to outside her window, with the actress alone in her apartment, seen without knowing who sees her, by herself but never truly alone. Film can easily be a voyeuristic medium placing us in a role of observer watching the private lives of unaware subjects. There are times when films push us to find a thrill in the watching, and other times when a movie interrogates our desire to spy on others. Perfect Blue puts its audience in the rare state of being the subject of that voyeurism, because we're so deeply entrenched in Mima's mind, consumed by a growing psychosis we can't escape. Film critic Roger Ebert once said, we are all born with a certain package. We are who we are, where we're born, who we were born as, how we were raised. We are kind of stuck inside that person. And the purpose of civilization and growth is to be able to reach out and empathize a little bit with other people, find out what makes them tick, what they care about. For me, the movies are like a machine that generates empathy. If it's a great movie, it lets you understand a little bit more about what it's like to be a different gender, a different race, a different age, a different economic class, a different nationality, a different profession, different hopes, aspirations, dreams, and fears. It helps us to identify with the people who are sharing this journey with us. Kohn's debut film is terrifying, but it's also deeply empathetic, which makes it all the more horrifying. 
It's a matter of perception. We see what Mima sees, growing all the more confused just as she does. What's real? What's hallucination? What's art imitating life? Alongside it, the line between lead character and audience begins to blur. It's no longer you and her, but us. Cone works to fracture identity. The self is no longer whole, but shattering more and more. The madness of Perfect Blue is a split within a split within a split within a split. The first split. It starts with a simple choice in changing professional identity. There was Mima the pop star and central figure of Chom, and now there's Mima the actress. Mima the pop star has been established for years, but Mima the actress is something new that takes time to grow. At its most simple, Perfect Blue is the story of choosing who you want to be, just with a whole bunch of murder. Through it all, a single question haunts us. It's Mima's only line in Double Bind, the crime show that gives her her first role. But every time we look in the mirror or see a disturbing face watching us, we're left with that question. Who are you? Until it turns on ourselves. Eventually, Double Bind itself becomes a mirror. Perfect Blue sits at the brief intersection between analog and electronic the coming of the internet. It's the shift in our lives from being insular to exposed, and in fandoms from being personal experiences to id-driven cults. There's a terror to the idea of fandom found here. Meme Mania is the most obvious example, but it's the pressure of not even being able to be out in public without someone watching you that's truly scary. And even when a letter meant for Mima explodes and nearly kills someone, her fears are dismissed. There's no glamour to being perceived. Mima is a small-time music star, with Cham barely charting before she leaves the group. Her break into acting is even smaller, but even the smallest stars have their rabid fanbase. Mima's life has all the pressure of being scrutinized by people who think they know her and what's best for her, but none of the advantages of being wealthy and influential. Mima becomes more and more aware of how her life and her own desires are being determined by the people around her. This creates an emotional, mental, physical, and professional vulnerability for our heroine without actually making her weak. Mima's precarious state isn't caused by her being weak-willed or uneducated. It's the product of the industries she's found herself in. Really, Mima's worst decision is to not be herself. Instead, putting on a mask for the sake of other people who aren't looking out for her. Mima isn't the first and won't be the last to be exploited. But there's a difference between how industries exploit stars and how fans choose to turn on their idols. Deciding what makes them unworthy of love, denying the person inside the star they cling to. It seems like realizing that an actor or singer or creator is a real human being with their own life and decisions and faults turns rabid fans into a pious, condemning jury. Mima began this journey to move away from the pop idol life that forced her to be an unchanging image and instead be a dynamic and whole person. Being a pop idol was Mima's childhood dream. Leaving that behind and becoming an actress was a logical business decision. That decision exposed her to new people trying to exploit her, but it also turned her old fans on her. Meme Mania's violent obsession is the most extreme version of that backlash, but it's everywhere. It's a terrifying idea that all that paranoia you feel is true, embodied in a person with the worst intentions. While the art, editing, and shot composition of Perfect Blue by Kon and cinematographer Hisao Shirai and editor Harutoshi Ogata is designed to confuse us, there are some key hints as to what's illusion. Specifically, it's the presence of blinding white light that comes from delusion, like the bright stage lights desired by so many here. It ultimately hides the truth and the person lurking within Mima's delusion. And for a film filled with so much metaphorical darkness, it's literal darkness that ends up being the most comforting because it assures us of reality. As the movie goes on, the line between reality, fiction, and hallucination blurs more and more. Experiencing flashbacks, waking up from nightmares, and acting in scenes from Double Bind, we're never cued to what's real and what's not until the moment is over. And even then, those distinctions become less and less clear. Kohn said, I distinguished between subjective and objective while making the storyboards. However, some scenes lead from sequences of reality to illusion, so I guess it is hard for the audience to tell which is which. However, it is not the object of the film to distinguish them. 
Eventually, scenes, characters, lighting, even cuts are propelled by Mima's perceptions, to the point that the filmmaking techniques are almost noticed by our lead as sudden changes in the world around her. There's an increasing amount of reflections found at first reflecting reality, then bringing hallucinations to life, and then revealing the reality behind those hallucinations. Beyond literal reflections, the most disturbing metaphorical reflection is Mima's room. The next split. Our actress discovers that a website called Mima's Room is run by someone pretending to be her and detailing the true-to-life decisions she makes. She's intimately known without knowing, and over time, the Mima's Room creator turns on her, saying she's being forced to ruin her career. Eventually, Mima's Room starts dictating the reality of Mima's life instead of the other way around a split in private and perceived personas. These personas are masks. The masks we choose to wear or that are placed on us by other people in our lives or by the public. Cohn's disorienting opening scene of a Power Rangers-like show is itself a mask on the film within, complete with people wearing masks. <laughs> Another split. Eventually, Mima agrees to be part of a rape scene in Double Bind, and while it's clear that this is acting, it's also horrific, and the shock of the scene causes her to dissociate. Years later, Kon would say he went too far, and was trying to provoke a reaction when the film was originally meant to be an OVA. It's a scene that real Mima chooses out of the belief it will push her forward in her career. Is that actually true? Kohn lets us decide for ourselves, but also illustrates this as another extension of the industry's exploitative nature. This is the death of Mima's old self, and the true start of her new self. But it also brings her virtual pop idol persona to life. It starts with a talking reflection. But soon, Mima sees a pop idol version of herself accusing her of not being real and tarnishing her image. Inside Mima, there are two fish. The lighter than air, skipping, glowing pop idol and the panting, earthbound, darkly lit human. A choice will need to be made. <laughs> Soon, Mima agrees to a photo shoot that quickly exploits her. Another despicable act that simply become accepted as part of this world. The slasher side of Perfect Blue comes to the forefront during its kills and attacks. Each graphically bloody, but only one shown in full. Like Mimania, these scenes slowly come to the forefront. First only heard about in the news, then with a victim shown before and after the kill, and then finally in full when the photographer who took advantage of Mima is brutally attacked, with Mima projected on Mima. In every case, the victim's eyes are gouged out, a vicious rebuttal to these cases of unwanted perception. Perfect Blue is psychological horror, with losing oneself being its ultimate fear but it also leverages the slasher subgenre in its lurking physical threat, first in the Mimania Stalker and then in the film's final attack. In both cases, it's the threat of physical penetration in the form of the killer's use of a screwdriver that translates the sexual threat posed by the many men around Mima. It's physical and psychological violation combined in one, making the metaphorical threats of the slasher their most literal. That stark real-world threat is what ultimately snaps Mima back into reality. It could have been easy to make Perfect Blue fall into a simple category. Oh, it was all a dream. Or it was just in her head because she's crazy. Instead, Kohn's story collides the psychosis that breaks apart a mind with the reality it impacts. The result is that we're given answers as to what was real and what was not, but still left to make our final judgments. The source of Perfect Blue's biggest scare is that our submersion into Mima's unraveling mind has hidden that what we've been experiencing is a shared psychosis, a folie à deux, and even perhaps a folie à trois. Mima's fight with her stalker demands that she takes hold of reality and beats him with a hammer to survive. Even then, the similarities between the attack and a double bind scene make us question what we've seen. We've been so focused on trying to determine what's real and what's delusion in Mima's mind, and dreading the closing threat of Mimania, that we've failed to notice the true terror of her manager, Rumi, creator of Mima's room. Dressed as pop idol Mima in a perfect recreation of her room, and now believing herself to be the real one. Determined to kill the imposter that dared ruin her image. 
Seeing the reality behind the illusion of virtual Mima reorients our perceptions of prior scenes. Was Rumi hiding in plain sight the entire time? Or was it all an illusion? Reality and hallucination blur without any way to truly delineate the two. By the start of its third act, we are utterly convinced that Mima must be the killer. How could we not accept this after Kohn shows us Mima herself killing the photographer? But in a film filled with masks, even a killer may not be who we see. The final battle between images of the self, fake and real, perfect and human, killer and survivor, is warped by Mima's delusions, turning Rumi into that perfect, glowing, virtual image we've seen so much. Even then, glowing delusion is forced back into dull reality for a moment, choking Rumi back into herself, seeing her panting, sweating reflection behind the floating idol, and finally shattered when Mima rips off her wig. Reality and psychosis are so inseparable for Rumi that she unthinkingly impales herself on shattered glass. Once again, reflections pierce delusions. In the final moments of the fight, Mima comes to terms with herself. <laughs> and in being able to understand reality, she saves the delusional killer from being hit by a truck, which Rumi sees as stage lights. You see, Rumi was once a pop idol too, but never succeeded and eventually settled into being a manager, vicariously living out her dream through Mima. And when Mima threw that away, it was too much for Rumi to handle, igniting an undiagnosed dissociative identity disorder that created her Mima persona. The final split. Everyone has dreams. Few make them into reality. Everyone has someone they want to be, but few get to become that. And when you grow up and know that your dreams have no chance to become real, how will you accept that? Are you living in the real world? For all its trauma and surreal horror, Perfect Blue ends on an uplifting note, with Mima assured of her own identity and reality defined once again. But the horrors of the world that she's lived through still exist. The photographers that exploit, the tabloids that feed on tragedy, the parasitic nature of fame that uses the vulnerable. Mima has made it through, but where will she go from there? No one is ever done becoming who they should be until the day they die. But to accept who you are and leave the past behind is the only way to grow. With its dangers of stardom at the dawn of the internet age, the late Satoshi Kon's horrors are both a forewarning of the times to come and an underestimation of what would await the world. In an age where everyone is hungry for fame, anyone can exploit themselves to gain an audience. The details of our lives are laid bare for anyone and everyone to obsess over. We seem to court the type of obsession that nearly took Mima's life, no matter the consequences. I think it is a problem everybody has, male or female, famous or anonymous, said Kong. I mean, there's a gap between the image people see of me and what I see of myself. Perfect Blue is about the tragedy caused by that gap becoming too large. How do you perceive me? Why would you think that about me? Who are you? Who am I? Who am I to you? Who will I be to you? Who will I be to me? Thanks for watching today's video and happy Halloween! Perfect Blue and the works of Satoshi Kon are a subject matter that I've been thinking about covering for a little while now, and I figured that the Halloween season and the truly disturbing horrors of Perfect Blue were a perfect match. It's a film that is as fascinating as it is disturbing, and I've really enjoyed, if you can use that word, digging into the deeper layers of Kon's movie. From its art style, to its editing techniques, to its acting, to the larger themes of its messaging, I feel like Perfect Blue is an example of just how amazing anime can be, and the many ways that horror can speak to societal fears, and personal fears as well. And what's even more disturbing about this movie is the ways in which it speaks to today as well as its time. Perfect Blue is a very intimate movie. It's focused on just a few people. It's focused on a very small-scale celebrity. But here in 2022, as I'm recording, small-scale celebrity seems to be what so many people are after. 
And being a YouTuber who puts out so much stuff on the internet, Perfect Blue really spoke to me as well. Personally speaking, I've found that as my channel has grown, it's easy to see people making more and more assumptions about who I am, as well as their relationship to me. Which is why I withhold so many details about myself from my channel, including not being on camera. And after being focused on Perfect Blue for a while, I don't think that I'm going to be making any changes to that. And what makes this movie so powerful is that ultimately intimate portrayal of Mima's own psychological degradation versus the larger exploitative industry around her that pushes that degradation even further. It's a dark movie that does have a hopeful ending, unless you are subscribed to the idea that it really was Mima killing those people, or maybe even just one of them, which Kon did admit to being a valid interpretation of his movie, even if he himself didn't intend that, which I think is really wonderful for a director and creator to say. But in any case, this movie horrifies and disturbs for a lot of reasons, all of which made for a perfect Halloween video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Perfect Blue and the larger filmography of Satoshi Kon. And if this video does well and people are interested in me covering more, I'd love to do more videos on Kon's other films. He was truly a master and someone gone way too soon. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support. And if you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only reviews, which I'm doing every week for Halloween. I'll be back again next week with another horror-focused video for the season, and until then, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and being careful with what you see in the mirror.